All right, and welcome to Algorithms Live. And for this week's episode, what we're going to be doing is covering these I, this idea of combining rolling hashes with Bloom filters. Uh, so Bloom filter is an exciting data structure. It can replace uh, hash map or hash set. Uh, and you can test whether something's in it or not. And rolling hash is just really cool technique on strings. You can use it in a variety of ways and even use it on things that aren't strings. So that's also a bit surprising. Um, and so that's what we're going to focus on this week. And so without further ado, let's, let's get started and see what we can do. So uh, the idea for this rolling hash technique is we want to encode strings. So let's say I have a string like A, B, C, A, D, something like that. And I'm going to actually start thinking of this as like a base alphabet number. So I mean by base alphabet, let's say we had a base 10 number. Um, and that, that would just be the digits of the number represented that number. So when I say base alphabet number, I really mean base 26 if I'm counting lowercase Latin letters. Uh, so if I took this, I could do A times uh, 26 to the fourth plus B times 26 to the third plus whatever C's value is times 26 to squared and so on. So we need to find some value to represent each of these letters. Uh, it's pretty natural. The first thing we can do is Say A represents 0, B represents 1, C represents 2. And so you just plug in 0, 1, and 2 for each of these numbers. And what you're left with is a really large number that represents the string. It's a representative of the string. Um, right now, this actually gives us a weird problem if we represent strings this way. So if I have a string like A, 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 and then its base expansion will look something like this. Which we all know comes out to 0. Well, we want these representatives to be unique, so we've got a pretty big problem here. That's, that's not going uh, too well. So we'd like to do a little bit better. Um, so there's two ways to fix this problem. So we've got our first fix. So our fixes look something like this. We could, the first idea maybe is encode the length in the hash. So we're, we're supposed to be hashing this number in some way, so we're probably going to mod it. Uh, so I could probably just like move everything over a certain amount and add the length or do something. And I'm going to say that's a little bit messy. I don't, I don't really like that solution. Um, the second option is don't use 0, because that's the only number that's being problematic for us right now. Um, so I'm just not going to use 0 at all. And instead, I'm just going to encode this thing as an alphabet size plus one number instead of an alphabet size. And then I'll slide what these representatives are. So I'll slide this representative to be one, two, and three, and so on. OK. So that's the representation. But I want to do something with this idea of rolling hash. So instead of just having a hash that is storing the string value, I want to be able to move a window of hash values. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to make a data structure that's a lot like a DEC. And so DEC stands for double-ended Q. Sometimes you'll hear it pronounced DQ. 
Um, I prefer deck because I like to think of it mentally as a pack of playing cards, and you can pull from both sides of the playing cards, and uh, it makes a lot more sense to me that way. So I use the word deck to describe it. Um, and we want to implement some operations on strings so we can move about these hashes to just change our hash values. So we're only going to be storing these hash values, um, but then we're going to have these operations to modify these hash values like we would modify the string. So we're not keeping the string around for any of these. We're just keeping the hashes, but I'll show you what this looks like. So we have operations, something like this. Um, the first the first one I'm going to implement is called add last. Maybe here are my operations. So if I have something like A, B, C, and I want to add X to the end, then what I'll do is I'll take a look at what this hash looks like initially. Well, I need to make room for this x. Because what I want to do is I want to get the polynomial hash that I would have for just a, b, c, x. So I'll do that. Well, I don't, I don't want 10. It's not base 10. Uh, what I'll do to make this a little bit easier is I'll say this alpha value right here is my alphabet size plus 1. And I'll use that for my notation. That, that'll probably be a little bit better. So I get something like this. And if I multiply this by whatever my alphabet size is, and then I add x, then what I'm left with is exactly what the hash would have been if I ran through it all at the beginning. which is exactly what we wanted. So x is actually 24. And so that, that's all we wanted for our uh, solution. Uh, so I can add things to the back. If I just want a Q, if I don't want a double-ended Q, if I want this data structure to be a Q, I could also implement pull first. So for this, I need to keep track of the length. So uh, make sure you know the length of the string. So uh, I'll do this on this string. So this is length 4. It's hash we already have up here, so I'm just going to go grab this real quick. All right, so if we want to pull first, we want to get rid of this A. All right, well, this value is A. So I just need to subtract that value from my hash. And I know this, I need to compute this value here. That's length minus 1. So it's alpha to the length minus 1 is going to give me what that is. And I need to know what character I'm removing. So maybe keep a real double-ended queue to keep track of this kind of stuff. Uh, and you'll know exactly what you need to remove from the hash to remove this character. So you do those two things. You remove the character. And what you're left with is 2 times this alpha plus 3 times this alpha plus 24 times this alpha, which I happen to know is the hash value of B, C, X, which is exactly what I wanted. So we're doing pretty well. So if you want to do a string matching algorithm, like Robin Carp, you just need these two functions. That'll give you uh, enough to get Robin Carp working. Uh, the other thing I'd like to add is you're going to want to pre-compute all values of this alpha to the K that are possible so that we can easily just multiply them by whatever our um, character is. So you just pre-compute a table of all these powers, and then you can remove bits from your hash, and uh, it's fast. So both these operations, running an O of 1, so we're already at a good start. OK, let's look at another operation. 
So sometimes what you'll want to do is maybe you're playing with these strings instead of doing a sliding window. You're able to put characters on the front, kick characters off. That comes up every now and again um, for rolling hashes. So I'm going to show you how to do two more fancy operations that are a little less common than those first two. So in this one, we're just going to add a string to the front of our hash. Add a character. So right now, our, our hash for ABC looks something like this. And what I want to do is I want to add it to the front. So I just take the next power of 2 that's not available. So once again, I need to look for the length. I add 24 times um, this alpha to the third. And that's going to prepend this x value. And so if you're a little bit concerned about how um, big this, this gets, uh, we're just going to mod this uh, eventually. So right now, just focus on the representation. Just think of it as a number. Um, but we'll mod it before it gets too big. But I want you to focus on just this representation of the string at the moment. And so the, the next piece is we want to do uh, pull last. This one's a little bit harder. This is probably the hardest of the operations out of all of them. So right now, I just want to remove C from my string. OK, so I, I want to remove this value. That's going to be C. So the first thing I do is I just subtract it. So in other words, I just subtract the character C. So I subtract 3 from my string. That's perfectly fine for my hash. Now I need to bring each of these alphas down by 1. So the way you do that is you divide by alpha. But we have a problem. We can't divide something like this because it's under modulus. Uh, so this is where mod inverse comes into play. So if you want to do something like divide by some number, so we'll say x divided by this, and you're under some modulus, what you can do instead is multiply by the inverse of a modulo some modulus p. I'll use m for the moment. And so then if you if you want to do a division, um, if you're trying to do something to, uh, to divide by x, you'll actually get this new value if you multiply by the inverse. So um, we want alpha's mod inverse. So before you even do any of these algorithm things, uh, the first thing you want to compute for your um, if you ever need to implement poll last, is you're going to want to compute the mod inverse of A and M. And you can do this by the extended Euclidean algorithm. So you can just look this up. Uh, it's a pretty simple algorithm. At some point, I might show you why that works. Um, but that's not this week. So all, all you have to do is just compute mod inverse. And if you're in Java, big integer has mod inverse built in. So you can compute that yourself. And it'll give you a way of dividing under modulus. All right. So those are our th four operations. So we have add last, pull last, add first, pull last. And that gives us a good starting place for our rolling hashes. Um, but we're computing things under, prime, uh, under a modulus. And I just want to show you what's the probability that two things collide. Uh, I, think, I think that's worth talking about. Um, so the first thing you want to do, for whatever modulus you pick, 
always pick a prime. So pick prime number for modulus. There are a lot of good proofs and reasons for doing things. Uh, I'll give you one property that's good for primes. Um, so the cycle length, if you just take any number um, greater than greater than one and you just multiply it repeatedly, the cycle length before you get back to that um, same number, mod p, is exactly p minus one. Any prime you pick, it's exactly p minus one, and that's from Fermat's little theorem. Fermat. Extremely useful uh, trick for number theory. Um, so it just, you typically don't get collisions very fast. It more uniformly distributes the data. Uh, and then there's another advantage to it um, with the next trick I'm going to mention. So let's look at the probability we end up having a collision uh, for these numbers under modulus. What I mean by a collision is I mean two strings that when you compute this hash under, under this modulus, they end up going to the exact same value. Get that probability low. That, that's my goal. So if I have n strings currently hashed, and this is my prime, p is my prime modulus, I want to compute the probability. This is going to be the probability that I create a new hash and it hits one of those strings. So this is the number of strings. And this is my prime. What I can do is calculate 1 minus that probability, and it will give me the probability I don't hit anything. So I can put this all together because I'm going to be doing several um, several pieces of this. So this is like sigma except for product. So you've probably uh, ah, familiar with uh, sigmas for summations. Uh, this is exactly like if I do p of x sub i, that's um, x1 times x2 times uh, dot, 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 xn. So that's what this big pi means. Um, just so you know, it'll be convenient for writing this formula out. So if I'm adding the ith string, generating it, this is the probability that I collide with something ahead of me if I'm adding n strings. So let's see what's the probability. So this is the probability I end up getting a collision after adding all the strings. Like I generate n strings. Um, we're assuming that the data is completely random. If it's not random, we're, we're kind of in trouble. Um, but all kinds of stuff could happen. And so let's look at what this probability looks like. So uh, I, can, I can calculate this out. Um, I'm just going to write some code in uh, Haskell, uh, or use Haskell as a calculator. Uh, so the way this is going to work, uh, let, let's just get some of this Haskell working first. That's 1 to 100. What I'll do is I'll write my formula. I have 1 minus i minus 1 divided by my prime. Well, a uh, really common prime people like to pick is 10 to the 9th plus 7. You probably see that uh, in contests all the time. And so these are, you can see the probability going down every time I add a string. Uh, the, it's, there's more strings available, so these are all the strings. And I want the product of all these together. So if I ended up adding 100 strings, and my modulus was 10 to the 9th plus 7, the probability I get a collision is going to be exactly this. So our probability I get out unscathed. So this means I had no collisions. Nothing hit each other. 
Um, chances are for doing top coder code forces, uh, we're going to see around 10 to the fifth strings, maybe something like that. Uh, just just the throwing a number out there. Uh, so that could easily happen. And now our probability we get on through unscathed is actually pretty low. So th this could be a bad thing. Uh, sometimes you'll be about 1,000. Um, you could get lucky with this. So if you want just one modulus, you're, you're fine. Uh, but if there were 10 to the fifth strings, you might be in trouble, uh, is all I'm saying. So how can we improve this? Well, I could pick a bigger prime. So 10 to the 18th, I don't know, uh, somewhere around 10 to the 18th, I could have a bigger prime. And my table is much bigger now. And you can see I'm doing much better. Um, and that, that's one thing I can do to get around it. Uh, but there's another thing I could do. And that's what I'll talk about next. So we're, we're computing these large numbers, uh, mod, mod the pr um, primer passing in. So that's why we don't have to worry about overflow. Yeah, so we're, we're keeping it under modulus. So when you multiply it, it's not going to overflow. And I, I tend to pick uh, 10 to the ninth for my primes, but I keep the multiplications in longs, and that prevents overflow. And I just mod it every step as I go. <clears throat> All right, so here's a tip. Use multiple moduli. So instead of storing one hash, store more than one hash. So in fact, I'm going to store two hashes, maybe three hashes. I usually pick about three hashes. I pick three different primes. Um, so if you want three primes, uh, I like 10 to the ninth plus 7, 10 to the ninth plus 9. So these are actually twin primes. They're two apart. Uh, and 10 to the ninth plus 23. These are some pretty good primes. Uh, of course, somebody could reverse engineer your hashing method and hack you if you pick these exact three primes. Um, so try to mix it up. Try to pick some weird primes uh, and be a little bit careful on the careful side. Um, but one of the reasons why we can get away with just computing a handful of different hashes, it all stems from the Chinese remainder theorem. So Chinese remainder theorem says that if you want to find some x, it's congruent to some number mod some prime here, and then some number, and then maybe it's congruent to 2 mod some prime here. So this answer is going to be unique to the LCM of uh, P1 and P2. So let me... Let me put this in layman's terms, uh, just in case I lost some of you. Um, in other words, if the uh, GCD of P1 and P2 is 1, and so two different primes don't share any common divisors, it's 1, then the LCM is going to be P1 times P2. And basically what this is saying is if you are walking x, so you do x plus 1, x plus 2. So you're counting on x, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. The amount of time it takes in an ordered pair, mod p1 and p2, that are the same again, is going to be that long, p1 times p2. So if you pick two relatively prime moduli, then you're effectively, you have a modulus that is p1 times p2 in size. So if you just keep adding more primes, you're actually making a really big number for the possible space for where your, um, your hash could be. So it's like a multi-dimensional hash now. It's really cool. So the probability of a collision, if you have n strings, 
It's just whatever your first prime is times your second prime times all the way up to your kth prime. So that, that's pretty good. We can, we can store a really big number without using big integers. Um, and our goal here is normally with hashing, if you have a collision, you just do like an order n check, and then you're fine. Uh, a lot of the problems you see in competitive programming, you don't have enough time to make that order n check. Um, so that's why we're trying to get this probability of a collision to be really, really small. And when sometimes people get really afraid of um, randomized algorithms or probabilistic algorithms. But one of the things that helps comfort me every time I'm doing one of these problems is if the probability that I'm going to have a collision is less than the probability that the hard hardware is going to fail when running my code, then I start to feel pretty comfortable. Because there's, like, think about it. You could submit code to code forces. It could be running. And then the computer could just fail, right? And if you get the probability down enough, it's actually more likely that the code is, the hardware is going to fail when you're running at your code than it is to have a collision in this table. And that's how I basically sleep at night or submit to code forces and feel good about it being correct. So that's my, uh, my technique for hashing. OK, so let's talk about how we can use this to implement uh, Rab and Carp. So let's talk about the that problem it solves. So imagine you have a string. And so this is some text that you want to search. And then you have some kind of a pattern here that you want to come find. So maybe like A, B, A, Z. So here it is. But both the text and the pattern could be really large. So if you implemented this naively, you could be searching. You go to each location. So that's order n. And then you do up to an order m check. And that's pretty slow. Um, if you look up uh, KMP, which is Knuth Morris Pratt, you can actually calculate all the places where this match occurs and n plus m time. Well, Rabin Carp solves the exact same problem, except it uses it with this rolling hash idea. Um, so for string hashing. So here's the base idea. First, you compute that hash on a string of the length of the pattern. So you just write out your polynomial. So this is a times alpha to the third, b times alpha to squared, uh, a times alpha to the one plus c, like all added together. So then we do pull first and add last in our data structure. And effectively, what I have in O of one time, so I just did two operations. Those are two mathematical operations, adding something, removing something. We looked at add first and pull last, or pull first, add last. Those were O of one operations. Uh, and so I could slide this window. This is why it's called a rolling hash. I'm just doing a sliding window. And I check this hash against the hash I generated from my pattern. So I keep doing that. So I, I look here. I'm looking at this hash. Is this hash the same as this hash? No. Is this hash the same as this hash? No. And you keep sliding. Everything's O1 in transitions. And I get out to this pattern, and these two hashes are guaranteed to be the same. So the only thing bad that could happen with Rabin Carp is you get a false positive, and the hashes collide, and accidentally you end up having two strings be the same. That's why we did so much work to make sure this probability was really, really low of a collision. But you can find all the cases where this pattern occurs um, just going uh, with this Rabin Carp. Uh, usually, what you do is you do a hashing equality check. So once you find that the hashes match, you check the string to make sure it really exists. Um, and that's the case with the problem Rabin Carp is trying to solve. But you'll see in my example from competitive programming, 
uh, you don't have enough time to check that string, unfortunately. OK, so let, let's talk about another operation you can do on rolling hashes that are uh, pretty powerful. Um, you can concatenate strings in O of 1. Not to, this won't be very surprising. But just knowing that you can do this is really powerful. <clears throat> so I have A, B, C, C, D, E. Can write out my hash like this. So A times alpha squared plus B times alpha to the 1 plus C alpha to the 0. So that's my first string. And I want to increase all these values. So I just multiply it by alpha to the third because I, I want to basically prepend them to CDE. And now I can add uh, the hash for CDE. So putting that all together, um, you can see this is alpha to the fifth, alpha to the fourth, because this will just distribute, and you'll get exactly the hash you were expecting. Uh, so the reason why this is useful is you can make a really long string and log in time. So imagine you had a string of length uh, 10 to the 18th, and you want it to have a bunch of cyclic repetition. What you could do is you could just build a really long string first and then just continually concatenate it to itself to get out to a really long length where it's repeating a bunch of times. Uh, and so that'll come up every once in a while in a problem where what you need to do is you need to just uh, concatenate that cyclic length string um, and handle it that way. Uh, and I'll, I'll post a problem from Kochi, which is the Croatian Olympiad, if you haven't seen it, that came up recently that you can try yourself and try to figure out how it uses this concatenate trick. It's a really hard problem, but it uses string hashing. And I'll put that in the description uh, after we're done today. Uh, and it's just really cool. Just kudos to them for making a great problem. All right. You don't always have to store hashes of strings is my next point. So if you're dealing with these rolling hash ideas, you can generalize it to anything that's a sequence. Uh, and that means anything you can store in an array that's like numbers, and you can store it in an array, you can use this rolling hash idea on and then have a really fast order one lookup for various things. So imagine I want to make a frequency table. So I have something like A, C, D, E, B, 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 A, C, A. So the frequency table is going to look something like this. I want to know the frequency each of these things occurs. So A occurs three times, B occurs three times, uh, C occurs two times, D occurs one time, and E occurs just one time. So I could store this using a hash. So the idea is I make my alphabet size whatever the max value that one of these frequency pieces could be. So I'll say maybe the length of the string. I just take that and make that the alphabet size. So I need to basically bound uh, what I'm doing. And now I can make a polynomial hash on um, exactly where I am in the string. Uh, this has a really convenient property. So let's say I had a, let's uh, make this table a little longer. Let's say I had a second frequency array. If I want to add these two frequencies or uh, frequency arrays together to get these values, I can do that just by adding the hash values that represent them. So in O of 1, I can. Um, 
update frequency arrays using rolling hashes. And that, that's pretty powerful itself. Um, so the way you populate these uh, frequency arrays is you just pre-compute alpha to the k for all of the um, for all primes. So you, you have to do it for every single prime because they all have different modulus, and for every single k value. And then. I can think of my positions in the table. So maybe this is 0, this is 1, this is 2, this is 3, this is 4. If I want to add something to C, well, then I just take 1 times alpha squared, because it's in position 2. If I wanted to add it to D, it would be alpha to the third. Uh, and I could just add that to my hash, and that ends up being the new value. So that that's a really uh, powerful technique where you can basically keep track of a frequency table um, as a rolling hash. And then if you want to compare two frequency tables in O of 1, you can do that just by comparing their hashes. You don't have to compare something more complicated. So this comes to the problem that I posted on the blog. Oh, I hit the wrong button. My bad. All right, here's the, here's the problem for the blog. Uh, so this was the Sakuba regional. I believe this is the Japanese regional contest for ICPC. Um, what you're given is you're given two strings. So uh, I could be given the string anagram, for example. And I'm given a second string. And this string could be called grandmother. And what I'd like to do is I want to find the longest length where I can pick two substrings of that length. So in this case, I'll pick, um, for example, I'll pick NA and AN. And what I'd like to be able to do is rearrange the letters in the second one to form the letters in the first one. And so you can see I can just form reform that, and I get NA, NA, and those are the same length, and I'm good. But that's not the longest one. The longest one I can form in this string is I can take Nagger and Gran, and I can just change them both to be NAGR. So this is a problem we'd like to solve. We, we want to know. Um, for these two strings, what's the longest anagram that can be formed? Well, you'll notice that if two strings are once an anagram of the other, then they have to have the exact same frequency array. If they do that, then they're going to be anagrams of each other. So the trick here is to store the hashes of these substrings as rolling hashes. So we don't have, a, we don't have enough time to compare every single substring against every other substring Compute the rolling hat or compute the frequency table and compare uh, frequency tables. So we're going to just save the frequency tables as we go and compute them as rolling hashes so we don't have to recompute the frequency table every time we add or remove a character. So we can do a sort of sliding window for every single string. So that, that's the base idea of it. Um, so if I compute what I'm going to do first is I'm just going to take this first string. And so for a string like A, A, N, A, N, A, and just so on, and then dot, 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 N, A, G, N, A, G, R, and continues on. So I take every possible substring um, that I can form, and I compute a rolling hash for that. This is how about how many substrings there are, is um, the cardinality of S1. And I can compute that using rolling hashes. So if I take all those hashes and I throw them into a hash set, let's say, so I'll just throw these into a hash set uh, or a multi-set or whatever you, whatever you want, then I can run over the second string 
doing rolling hashes as well, and try all subsets, or try all substrings, contiguous substrings, uh, for string S2. And then I can just check if each of these strings is in the hash set. So I did this when we were competing in this contest for practice. Uh, so there's about 4,000 strings uh, in S1 and S2. Um, so you get about 4,000 squared. Um, and you're doing it twice, so it's pretty slow. Uh, and it TLEs, it, it times out. So that, that was disappointing. Um, it, it all comes down to this hash set being too slow. Uh, I'm putting a lot of things into a hash table, first off. And then I'm querying this hash table, and there's overhead whenever you compute a hash table. It's doing linear probing or whatever it's doing. Uh, and even though theoretically hash tables are O of 1, in practice they're often a little bit worse. Um, so that's where Bloom filters came to save the day. And so that's what we're going to talk about here, is you're going to see that Bloom filters, they pair very nicely with this idea of rolling hash. So here's my Bloom filter. So <clears throat> the way a Bloom filter works is it's basically just a bit set. So instead of storing all this information on a hash table, it's very complicated. You're storing a lot of information about the hashes, maybe the original object. Uh, a Bloom filter takes a very minimalistic approach. It says, I'm just going to store single bits of information as an alternative to hashing everything. And I'm going to have multiple hash functions, which is exactly why this pairs so well with rolling hashes. And so initially, all the bits are off. So then I take my hashes. And when I add something to a Bloom filter, I just set those bits to true. So that's an insert. Turn. So the way insert works, turn on bit for each hash. It's going pretty good. Now, if I want to find something is in my built uh, um, my Bloom filter, I can do a query. So I look through each of my hashes and see if all the bits that it occupied are on. So if I get a different set of hashes, maybe one of them might be on, but some of them won't be. And that's OK. It's not in my Bloom filter. And that's a Bloom filter in a nutshell. It's not, not a very complicated data structure. You just take the multiple hashes, you put them down. Uh, to insert, you just turn on those bits. To remove, you just are, are you can't remove. There's That's one thing I'd like to point out. There's no way to remove things from um, a Bloom filter. Uh, there's some special cases where you can remove things, but it's messy and it pretty much won't come up in a programming contest. So if, if you need a query table, that's what Bloom filters are good for. Um, and you'll notice that it can have these false positives. So bad things can happen. And this is exactly the same thing as Rabin Carp. Rabin Carp, you could have a collision and you have a false positive. Um, you, you basically think two strings match and they really don't. Um, so we here, here's what a false positive looks like. Maybe this is one of my um, bits that gets turned on. And then another piece um, adds these bits that get turned on. And then I do a query, and I query this bit, this bit, this bit, and I go, hey, look, it's in my Bloom filter. 
and that's a po false positive because I never implement or I never added a string that looks like this. So that that's problematic. Um, what we want to do is we want to get that false positive rate really low. That's that's really what we want to do. So let's look at some problems that can occur. Um, usually, if you read some of the um, tutorials on Bloom filters, they'll say the probability of a false positive is 1%, and they think that's pretty low. If we want it never to happen, this is not low enough for us uh, because we're going to be querying a lot of things in Bloom filters. And so a 1% false positive rate will become really disastrous really fast. Uh, and we'll, it won't work for contest. So we need to modify the classical Bloom filter and make it really good for contest in the same way we modified rolling hashes um, to make them really low probability of having a collision. So let's look at a few of the problems uh, that can occur if you want to implement Bloom filters for contests. First off, what happens if your set is too small? So you didn't use enough bits. What could happen is the Bloom filter gets really full. And if you just have ones everywhere, then any string you query, it's going to say it's there. Everything is here. And that's bad. That's that's a really high false positive rate. Um, so that's one problem we could have. Another problem is if we're using Rab and Carp, if we're trying to do that one-two punch, Rab and Carp Bloom filter. Well, here's our our only difference between our hashing functions is the modulus right now. This was perfectly fine when we were throwing them into a hash map, but we're storing these hashes multiple times. So if we ever get our polynomial hash less than the modulus, which happens any time we have a small string, we're going to end up hitting the exact same place without, without fail. And that, that's problematic because we're not spreading out the bits for our Bloom filter, so it's going to query that same spot. So imagine what happens. All that has to happen is one of the hashes in a much longer string have to just hash to that exact same spot. And then we query three times in that exact same spot. Uh-oh, we have a false positive on a small query string. So all you would have to do to break the Bloom filter is have your test set be a bunch of really long strings, and your query set just be a bunch of really small strings, and you'll definitely break it. So if you want to challenge someone on code forces, you see they're using a Bloom filter incorrectly, and you see this bug. This is a great way of constructing a challenge case to break their Bloom filter. Uh, so we can, we can break this up, though. We can get around this problem pretty easily. Um, one of the things we can do is just start everything, start each hash at an offset. And if we do that, then we're golden. So we can just offset things by the hash and then uh, everything, uh, then we won't have this problem of them all lining up and everything will um, move a lot faster. OK, so we had a question. It says, how do we know which bits to turn on? Or are we just oring the hash uh, with the Bloom filter? So you know which bits to turn on because they're going to be the hash functions that come out of Rab and Carp. You're not going to or that mask with the entire Bloom filter. That's going to be entirely too slow. You're just going to flip the bits that you see that are relevant. Um, so if your hash came out to 4, 7, and 100, then you just flip 4, 7, and 100 in your bit set. And so it's um, just three, three calls to your Bloom filter or to your bit set to implement and add to your Bloom filter, uh, which makes things pretty fast. OK, so these problems up here, let's talk about some of the solutions that make it a little bit easier to implement things for Bloom filters. First one, make the Bloom filter huge. So make the bit set huge relative to how many strings you have. That's the first thing you could do. 
I the first time I did this, I made my bloom filter have 10 to the ninth bits. And that fit in memory. That was perfectly fine because it's going to store them all as lungs. So that's about 15 million lungs. And that easily fits in memory. Remember, a lot of these things is just going to be wasted space of zeros, but you already do that anytime you store small numbers as longs uh, or small numbers as ints. There's just going to be a lot of padded zeros because it's a 32-bit integer. So it's perfectly fine to have 10 to the ninth bits. One of the advantages of using a bit set is you get all this free space. Um, everything's only taking up one bit, uh, which is awesome. Uh, the second thing we can do is we can add more hash functions. So per hash function, it, it, the probability of failure goes down. And you'll see in a minute, there's a trade-off for doing both of these. You don't want to make your bit set huge and then add like 100 hash functions. It uh, might not uh, work. There's a balancing factor for this. In fact, if you know how many strings you have that you're going to be putting into your Bloom filter, and you know how big your Bloom filter is, there's an optimal number of hash functions that you should have in order to decrease the probability that you have a, um, a collision. And there's kind of a sweet spot. Also know every time you add a hash function to your Bloom filter, uh, you're increasing the runtime of a query to your Bloom filter because that's one more bit you have to check to make sure something is in your Bloom filter. Um, but there is a sweet spot, so we'll be getting to that. So that's solution one basically together is uh, make the bit set huge, get the optimal number of hash functions. Another thing we could do is get multiple bit sets going. So I could have one bit set per hash function. So let's see how why this is smart. Uh, right now we have this really weird problem. So let's say I have this. Um, that's my bit set. And let's say my hash function went here. That's hash 1, hash 2, hash 3. And then I do a query. I could have a string that the hashes are the same, but they come out in a different order. And they collide in my bit set. So if I just ended up breaking this up into a bunch of into three different bit sets, and I stored all of hash 1 in the first bit set, all of hash 2 in the second bit set, and all of hash 3 in the third bit set, then I wouldn't have this problem of weird collisions. In fact, uh, it, it just makes it so much easier. And the, the analysis actually gets um, different on this one. So you, you can look up some of the analysis on uh, having multiple bit sets or modify the analysis I'm about to give you um, to work on multiple bit sets. And it's got a different sweet spot. And I think it's a little easier to analyze. So I'll leave that to you to hash uh, to, to work through. Um, and some combination of these solutions makes it that the probability that you get a false positive is really, really low. Uh, and it makes Bloom filters really easy to use in contests. And so let's talk about the runtime again. And I'll just put this, this down. It's O of the number of hashes. So for, let's say we have four hashes. So I just do four queries to my bit set. And then I know whether or not that string is in the in the uh, the data set, and that's so much faster than hash sets. So that's how I got this problem to pass uh, when I was competing in the pr the practice. Is I just built this Bloom filter, queried to the Bloom filter, and um, just that's the only thing I changed in my solution with this frequency table and hashes for that problem, and it was just lightning quick. Um, so if you're trying to get away with some cheesy hashing solution uh, and there's like an elegant like order n solution, Bloom filter might be a way of uh, sneaking by uh, the time limit and getting a hashing solution by. So really good combination between Bloom filters and um, rolling hash. 
And again, I want to point out that these hash functions are already broken up. There's multiple hash functions. Um, so that's why uh, that's why they work so well. So there was a question, don't you mean 10 to the ninth divided by eight? Uh, yeah, if I if I wanted to know the number of bytes that I was using, then 10 to the ninth divided by eight would be exactly that. But I was just wanted to know the number of longs that my bit set would hold. Um, usually with um, programming contests, I've trained my brain to know about how big of a long array I could make um, in memory to get away with things. Uh, and so that's how I'm running this calculation. But if you want the number of bytes I'm using, it would be about 10 to the ninth divided by 8. OK, so coming back on this, the, the last thing I want to do uh, today is just go over the math behind Bloom filters a little bit, so how we get that estimate and some of the sweet spot. Uh, and I'll put up a link um, additionally on um, exactly where that sweet spot is. There's this nice table somebody built for Bloom Filter that'll tell you for some density of n and m, which are the table size and number of keys, you can find what k is going to be optimal. And I'll try to give an intuitive explanation of why there's like a sweet spot and not just maximize number of hashes. <coughs> So let's say we're inserting a hash value. We want to know the probability when we insert that hash value um, that that bit is 0. So I'm going to assume all these insertions are independent. Um, you'll notice when we were dealing with uh, rolling hashes, I assumed they weren't independent. And the analysis got a little more complicated, but we used Haskell to get that to work. Just assume it's a 1 in m chance that I hit something that's already there. I guess I should explain what n is. So I'll say that n is the key, num keys. So num keys is like the number of strings that I'm trying to hash. And m is my table size. So that's how big my bit set is in bits. And k is the number of hashes. So the number of hash functions that I'm using for my Bloom filter. Um, so if I'm inserting k bits, that's the probability that they're all not colliding with, any, with each other. And I'm making some assumptions, saying that they're independent. Um, but from what I'm told, that this probability is not that far off when you do the analysis. So you can uh, make it fairly accurate. Uh, well, then I'm going to be adding n different keys to my bit set. So I just multiply by n. So I want the probability that I end up getting um, a false positive on my query. So this is, um, this is what everything looks like when it's being added to the bit set. If I do my query, and this is for a single query, that's the probability they're all spread out. I query k bits. If one of those bits is off, I'm OK. This is the probability that they're all turned on, but this string was not in the data. So I just query my k bits, and that's what my false positive probability is. Uh, I can rework this with some crazy algebra. I get 1 minus e to the negative k n divided by m to the k. So what we want to do is we want to minimize this function, um, because that'll um, minimize the probability of a false positive by minimizing this function. Uh, and I'm not going to show you the work, but if you want, you can look on Wikipedia or the site that I'll post in the description. Uh, this is the exact value that minimizes this function. So. Let's talk about this in layman's terms uh, without, the, without all the math. Um, we're looking at an equation here where m 
it's m over n, basically, times some constant factor. So just think of this ratio between n and m. So m is my table size, and n is my number of keys. So if I increase my table size to a certain amount, and I have some number of keys, I want to find the number of hashes that minimizes this probability here. Well, that function is going to look something like this, roughly. Uh, it's going to have some um, global minimum. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure I drew this function right. I didn't put it into Wolfram or anything. Um, but here's, here's where the good K looks. And I'll try to intuitively explain why it has this shape. So imagine you just have one hash. Then your probability that you have a collision um, goes down because you're adding less things here. So this exponent goes down because it has a smaller factor. Um, so this probability is uh, also going to go up because you're not hitting it multiple times. So that's an improvement. Um, but so what we um, are, are not not an uh, it improves it in that way. But if you query now, you only have to have one of your bits get that false positive for the query. So what you saved in number of bits that are in your Bloom filter, you're losing in the number of bits that you're querying that have to fail. So you increase the hashes. So if you're slowly increasing the hashes, at some point it might come out to be equals n times k. And if that occurs, your, ha uh, your, your bit set is going to be full. So there's going to be some case where adding too many hashes is too, uh, is too much of a good thing here because your, your um, bit set that's holding all these hashes is going to get too dense and the false positive rate is just going to start skyrocketing as it approaches m equals n times k, which is a completely full bit set. So then it makes sense that you'll be, in, just intuitively, that if you increase the number of k's, you're, you're going to go down in probability because it's going to improve on the number of false positives for the query. But then eventually, it's going to start going back up as you get closer and closer to this m value, and your table starts filling up too big. So that's my intuitive explanation for why even a sweet spot exists. Um, so for my example of having 10 to the ninth bits, and then maybe 10 to the fifth strings that I'm just working through, well, my factor is 10 to the fourth. You'll see on the link that I post that a lot of the factors they actually want are like 32. So their, their table is a lot smaller, and they get some pretty good probability with only a few hashes and only a factor of 32. So it would be like 30. Uh, the table size I'd have to make, it would just be 32 times 10 to the fifth over 10 to the fifth. But by making my table ridiculously big like this, I bring that probability way down. And by bringing the probability way down, it's exactly what we want. We want that false positive to be really slow, so we get accept or really low, so we get accepted when we submit to code forces. Uh, so that's that's the whole uh, uh, idea um, behind making that bit set really big. Um, and so that that's how you can basically actually use Bloom filters for programming contests. So I hope to see these show up. Uh, in competition from you guys, and uh, yeah, and try to get these string problems by uh, by the data by using Bloom filters instead of these hash sets. Um, it doesn't have an application in every problem, uh, so it's mainly if you just want a table to know if strings are there. So it's not going to replace a hash map, um, and if you have to remove the strings for any reason, you're better off using a hash set because a Bloom filter is not great for removal. Um, but that's all I have for this week. Uh, next week, we'll cover another exciting topic. And I hope you all join me. Uh, I'm going to start looking for a few more guests. So uh, get the word out that I'm looking for guests. And uh, I'll try to try to bring on someone else that's exciting. I know a lot of you liked Dion last week. So uh, I'd like to have another guest. Um, so that, that does it for us this week for Algorithms Live. But I'll see you next week for sure. Uh, and yeah, see you then.